All right, we've got an excellent interview for you guys today. In fact, it might be an excellent adventure. You don't even know who it is yet. Why would that be funny to you? All right, it's Alex Winter. He's, of course, the star of Lost Boys, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and, of course, there was a sequel. But he's on here to talk about his new movie, which he directed, called Downloaded. Yeah. Now, of course, as we do in these interviews, we're going to talk about it all. All, all right. right. Okay. But, Alex, first, on. welcome. Thanks for coming Thank on. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, now, first, uh, let's talk about Downloaded. Uh, one, what's it about? Uh, Downloaded primarily is about the rise and fall of Napster, which was um, the basically the birth of file sharing, global community, internet, chat, all that stuff in uh, back in 98, 99. It was created by Sean Fanning and Sean Parker when they were teenagers, and then it was crushed by the record industry uh, in about 2001. Um, and it's really about the rise and fall of Napster and looking at that company closely. It was a really revolutionary company, which caused a lot of provocation. Um, but then also how that relates to the sort of the battles going on around the internet and those rights, freedoms, the questions of, of all of that sort of uh, divisiveness and contention that we're dealing with today. So random side note on the movie, uh, I watched it of course, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Sean Fanning, how, like his family is so um, middle class, you know they got the Boston accent. Mm -hmm. Sean Fanning magically does not have the Boston accent, right? Right, and is like this uber genius kid. That was is it? Is this kind of an amazing thing? I don't know. Yeah. I, I kind of got stuck on that. How yeah. does that happen? It's just. I mean, you know, it's really. I met I met Fanning in two thousand and two. Um, I was really taken with Napster from a sort of social and political um, perspective. I mean, just because I was a, a layman interested in technology in those days. Um, and then I met him and it was a whole different ballgame, sort of like you're saying. And what I was really, I was really taken by both him and Parker, who are, are like most really brilliant people that you meet, or you know, frankly, beyond brilliant, probably genius level people, who you don't get to meet that many of in life, they're extremely idiosyncratic. You mm -hmm. know? Um, I think it's really hard to capture the idiosyncrasies of certain kinds of genius, which is why I really wanted to make this a doc eventually and not a narrative, is that it's, it's hard to sort of like write genius dialogue. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's the idiosyncrasies that make them interesting. So Napster, I think, is an, interest, is an amazing story in terms of what it, what it did as a world-changing technology. But as a character study, it's equally fascinating because they're fascinating guys. So the Sean Fanning, Sean Parker dichotomy is also was interesting to me because, so Fanning is the guy who mainly did the tech stuff. Is that is that fair or is Sean, how much of the tech stuff does Sean Parker? Well, here's how, here's how Napster worked. Absolutely. Sean Fanning, uh, thought of Napster, um, coded Napster, and was Napster. Sean, that was his, his childhood nickname was Napster. Sean Fanning created Napster, and Parker came on um, after Fanning uh, created it and coded it, and, they, and they'd known each other for years. They'd known each other, they'd, they'd created companies together in high school when they were like 14, 15, without ever having met via the internet. Uh -huh. um, so it wasn't like he came in like, you know, out of left field. Um, but they became partners and, and, um, and Parker was, was extremely instrumental in um, scaling that company and making it grow the way that it grew, um, you know, helping with financing and all that sort of stuff. But, he, but Parker is a tech visionary of his own, absolutely of his own right. I mean, you're talking about a guy who helped scale Napster, Facebook, and Spotify, three of the most disruptive technologies in modern, you know, in computer history, right? So, um, so, but it got, like, I got the sense that Sean Parker's skill was putting things together, right? So putting people together, putting money together, like almost a producer in, ter in, the, in the entertainment world, right? Yeah. And, and he wound up being much more handsomely rewarded than Sean Fanning, whose skill was technical and creation, et cetera. No, they've both been pretty handsomely rewarded. I mean, they're both doing really, really well. <laughs> okay, you know? well, I mean, right. God it's, bless it's them, kind right. of, you know, I mean, Fanning, you know, sold his gaming company to EA for 30 some odd million dollars and is doing perfectly, is, he's a brilliant entrepreneur and has a great business mind. So, I mean, in a way, I, I kind of buck against those, those um, uh, kind of the idea of, of pigeonholing them that way because, um, the biggest problem that I have with Napster and with the internet in general, a lot of the stories of the internet have gotten so sort of hyper mythologized by the media, and it's very easy to get branded. And Fanning is the sort of like you know quiet genius guy, and Parker's a sort of huckster business guy, and it's so not that simple. And the fact is, you're dealing with two 
super genius tech guys who know their way around computers and they were both very, very notorious hackers in their early teens. Right. Um, who were able to penetrate extremely complex systems. So it wasn't like Parker is just a front man. No, I got you. So it's, it's funny, I, I'm having this trippy moment where I'm talking to a guy when I was growing up, uh, played in Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and he's <laughs> talking to me about hyper-mythologizing. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, okay, all right. Like, I would not have guessed that, that, would, that I would be having well, this there's, conversation. Well, there's a good example of being branded, right? <laughs> right, exactly, exactly to your yeah. point. I was not Bill, just for the record. Uh-huh. Okay. There, now we can end that. Yeah. <laughs> I played him, yes. but, uh, but I wasn't him. Wow. Yeah, my, it's a trip. I know. My, I know. my yeah. mom is convinced that if someone plays specifically yeah. an evil character really well, yeah. then they are actually evil. Well, you know, a lot of people feel that way. Like a lot of my friends, people ask me all the time, like, because I, I stopped acting professionally in 93. So I, but I get recognized every day because of Bill and Ted. And people ask me, do I get sick of being recognized for being Bill? And honestly, I don't because the characters were so lovable that 99% of the time people come to me like, oh, you were Bill. But I've got friends who were like, you know, played the villain in Die Hard or whatever. Right. And people come up and spit in their face, <laughs> you know, because like, awesome. you're, like your mom, they just assume, you know, you're, well, you're a terrorist. I saw you do terrible things. So that's insane. you've got to be careful. I love my mom, but it's yeah, really insane. It is. And people, okay. that's how people are for sure. No, and and it's, like, don't get me wrong. My mom doesn't think they actually are that person. Right. right? She just thinks there's a little there's bit of evil inside right, you. Yeah. Let's just keep to be it able real. To play that so well. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So uh, speaking of which, so why did you stop in 93? So that's a, a lot of people would think that's a really interesting and curious decision. Because you're doing great, you got these amazing movies out. Mm -hmm. So why why'd you do that? Um, well, the thing is, I started acting. I got my SAG card when I was 10 years old. I started acting as a child actor. Mm -hmm. um, I did TV commercials. I was on Broadway all through my childhood, through my teens. Um, and all I ever wanted to do was was direct and write. That was the only thing. Oh, I, so okay. I so I I've quit acting many times in my life. Okay. But the first time I quit was when I was 17. I was like, I'm done, I don't want to act anymore. I took all my money from Broadway and I went to NYU Film School to direct. Mm -hmm. And when I came out of NYU Film School, like anyone who goes to a major university, I was dead broke right, and in massive right. debt. Yeah, so, I hear you, brother. Yeah, so I called my manager and agent who I still have. I was like, can you like get me a couple of auditions just because I really don't want to deliver pizza. I'd really like to like work on my movie scripts and maybe act in some stuff because it pays better. Mm -hmm. And just I just managed to like book Lost Boys and like all these giant movies back to back. It was not honestly, by sort of career intention. Mm -hmm. So I had an enormous amount of fun, you know, I mean, uh, but it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So as soon as, at the same time as I was acting in those movies, um, I was directing music videos, TV commercials, I was building my reputation as a director. And frankly, as soon as I could make money directing and not have to make money acting, I quit. So that, okay, so that partly explains it. When you were a child actor, uh, did you enjoy it or not enjoy it? Like, and so, so because that's a really interesting thing that the rest of us don't get to experience at it's, all. It's actually the subject of my next movie. I'm working on, my next documentary is about children in show business. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm working on it with uh, the Zipper Brothers that produced uh, Undefeated, the football documentary. And um, it's a question that, I, that I've always been fascinated by. Um, I had a really great experience working on Broadway um, my experiences were challenging. I think being in the entertainment industry as a kid, um, it's hard enough to be in that industry as an adult. Uh, and as a kid, you have to develop, and that's sort of your, you know, your whole purpose biologically. Mm -hmm. um, and that development is going to get um, impaired on some level, no matter how great your parents are, no matter how great your experience is. So you're going to have some. Why? Sort of Why does it get impaired? Because you don't, you, you're, you're basically adultified. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're in a, you're sort of brought into a work system that's been designed for grown-ups, not for children who are developing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the time that should be spent um, kind of living in the, the sort of incubator of development doesn't happen mm -hmm. in the way that, you know, you're sort of pulled out of the Petri dish a little bit. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I always wondered, you know, if you were gonna give advice to somebody who's considering, because everyone, we live in LA, so every once in a while you get somebody who's thinking, well, should I have my kids go into acting or modeling, whatever it might be, mm -hmm. right? What advice would you give? Well, you know, I, I don't deter people. I work, I direct a lot of kid stuff, um, and I have three children, three boys, and so I think about this stuff a lot as a parent. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't deter people from from it, um, and I've had uh, fabulous experiences working with with you know child talent. But I do try to uh, make it clear to the parents or to whoever I'm talking to. Because a lot of times people ask me, like, should I put my kid? I don't know. You did it. Should I do it? 
And it's really, you know, it's the commitment of knowing that because you're taking your kid out of a normal development, you know, environment, you have to recognize that they are no longer in, they're in an alien environment, and you're going to have to compensate for that. And if you don't, there are going to be major repercussions. Are you glad your parents did it or no? Um, well, it's funny. I was so willful as a kid. I sort of like, it wasn't, I didn't have stage parents, you know, so I sort of had to convince, I wanted it badly enough. I liked the entertainment industry. I wanted to be around people who were creative. Um, I always had an interest, as I said, even as a little kid in directing and writing, and I wanted to be around other people who were making things. So I pushed my parents. You know? Oh, okay. So as much as you wanted to be a director and sometimes would get tired of acting, yeah. you, you were willful in of, wanting to. Absolutely. There's no way. You don't, you don't get into big movies if you don't want to. You have right. to put work into it. I love acting, so don't get me wrong. I, lo I, mean, I still train and study acting. I still work with acting coaches and stuff because it helps my directing and writing. I love it. But it's, for me, I get, I, my sort of, my expression comes more from writing and directing. But I, it's not like I disown the acting work. So now let me ask a question I always ask when I'm interviewing people who had these big explosions in their careers, right? It's in the entertainment world. Not, not when I'm interviewing physicists who made it. <laughs> so, but like when you, you get the fame, right? Mm -hmm. You get the money, but the money's not that interesting. The fame is interesting, right? Mm -hmm. So does it change your life? Uh, did, were girls throwing themselves at you, et cetera? It, to it absolutely concretely changes your life. I mean, it changes your life permanently. Um, and you have to reconcile that. Now, thankfully, I'd had a taste of that as a little kid, you know, working on Broadway and big Broadway shows meant we had, you know, our backstage door was mobbed with thousands of kids every night. You know, you were signing autographs, you were doing, you know, you know daytime TV show interviews and stuff like that. I started doing that at 12, 13 years old. Um, so I, I'd had a taste of it. I kind of knew what it meant to not lead sort of the normal life. Um, but uh, I also like my, um, I like being accessible, you know. Um, I like riding the subway, walking down the street, traveling wherever I want to travel, being sort of part of the herd and not either above it or separated from it. So that part of it I had, I had a problem with because I, I remember when Bill and Ted 1 came out, it was literally my life changed the day it came out. I remember like, the afternoon before it hit the first theater, I, I was in Texas actually shooting a music video. I wasn't even in, in LA. And I, like, well, I walked into like a diner to get change and the whole place like stopped That's and awesome. stared at me. Uh -huh. And that was like on the Friday of the weekend of the release of Bill and Ted 1. And I walked out and I thought, that's it. My life is never going to be the same. And it wasn't. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really like that concrete, like a storm kind of hitting you, you know? That's and, fascinating. And that was it. I mean, that was 25 years ago. And my, that's the way my life is still because the movies are on all the time, everywhere. And so how much of it did you love and how much of it did you hate? I didn't hate any of it. I mean, uh -huh. you, I, mean I, I have to honestly say, um, I'd have to say, you have to be pretty cynical to hate being in a hit movie. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? No, I know, but like, but so I was talking to some uh, other person who had a celebrity experience, and they say just very similar to what you said, the gravity of the room changes, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody starts looking this way. And there's something that's a little disconcerting about the whole room looking at you and concentrating on you, it's, it's a little unnerving. Yeah. So did you have any of that? I That's had it a I little mean. bit, but I had it a little bit. But you know, um, what really helped me was that I grew up in theater. Um, and I remember I, I, one of my earliest experiences was doing The King and I with Yul Brynner. Mm -hmm. And I remember Yul Brynner uh, talking to me when he first hired me and just saying, because I had done th some theater before, but not on that scale. And we were taking it on the road and we were doing some very big theaters that had like massive, you know, seating that was way bigger than the Broadway theaters. And I remember he took me aside, he just said, you know, you really have to get in a zone with, with blocking out that wall of faces or it, wills, it will fry your circuitry while you're on stage. And I mean, he was really an amazing guy and, mm -hmm. very, and very compassionate. And, um, and sort of growing up in theater, I sort of just kind of took that into the public with me. So like, I've always had that you end up with a dualistic existence where I remember, you know, all of my friends were my same, I've had the same friends since I was six years old. So my, my circle never changed. Right. Um, that's huge. That's and really it's, important. It's massive. It's, and on the child actor thing, that's almost all of it, is sort of keeping that, that community with you of no regular people. That never changed. I never lived in Hollywood. I always lived outside of Hollywood. I never immersed myself in that culture. And I remember like, you know, working with my film buddies one night at like three in the morning on an edit and walking into a supermarket and seeing my face on a cereal box. And I remember just thinking, 
there's no connection between me and that image at all. It was, it was right. literally like it could have been anybody. Right. So you kind of disconnect yourself from it. That's a little I surreal. Yeah. yeah. So talk to me about the good sides. A lot of more girls. Um, uh, did I you mean, buy a yacht? What did I mean, you do? I think it was, yeah, it was either Woody Allen or somebody made the comment, like, the best thing about celebrity is, you know, getting a table at a restaurant, which is kind of true. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like you do get used to being able to sort of do some of that stuff. And then... Like it's, you, like you walk in on Bill. Step aside. Yeah, not that. Just like being able to call <laughs> and just go get this. You know, I want this table at such and such. You know, sure, absolutely, you're done. You know, okay. and it's uh -huh. and it's really trivial, but it's like it's almost that goofy little stuff like that that makes it that makes it. Well, fun. I mean, to some degree, you that's know. power, and that's uh, there's nothing wrong with you know. Yeah, I like, suppose so. As long yeah. as you don't lord it over people and you yeah. don't abuse it, right? Yeah, like, I mean, it's yeah. power like having an easy pass is power. I'm like, I don't yeah. know what power we're talking about. But yeah. yeah, you know, you get through the toll faster. Yeah. Um, but yeah, being... Convenience too. Sure. Yeah, exactly. It's convenience. Having having celebrity um, from like, you know, 18 to 24, 3, when, when I had it, was a great time to have it. It was a lot of... I mean, we like, had... I, I, look, I'll be honest with you. If I was in your situation, I probably would have sex with minimum 400 girls. Okay, yeah. minimum. Right. So we're, we're, we're over or under? What are we talking? I, about? I'm not. I, I can't. You know, it's the internet, so I can't. I can't start. You know, I can't give you numbers. I'm not going to pull a Wilt Chamberlain on you here. No, I got you. But, yeah. but like, but you enjoyed it. You enjoyed I definitely them. enjoyed it. I mean, okay. I remember yeah. doing Lost That's Boys. Great. It was awesome. I remember shooting Lost Boys, and I was like, I got hired to do that. I was this, a dirt poor film student, like living in like a basement apartment on the Lower East Side. And I remember like the first night I flew to Santa Cruz to start start shooting, and I was doing only nights because I was playing a vampire. And I remember, it was like, we got out there, they gave me my motorcycle, we suited up, it's like 11 at night, we're shooting on the boardwalk of Santa Cruz, and like 9,000 people lined up to watch us, and things kicked off, you know? And mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a really fun time, and it was a fun time in the movies as well, I think. Yeah, it's good, because, you know, I, you're in a, in, a, in a great position there, and I always think that if I'm ever in a great position, whatever it might be, money, fame, whatever, right? Is that I'd want to enjoy it for the, for everybody else, right? Like you know, you want to suck yeah. the marrow of life, yeah. Like because you don't want to waste it, exactly, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm glad you did. That's oh, awesome. I had a blast, and it's like I associate you know the that movie work with my youth, and it was a really good time. Yeah. You know. So one more thing about this, and then I want to go back to to the movie again because there's so many things I want to ask about that. So you know, you stopped acting in '93, and then you went on to do the the other things, and now you know you're directing this movie, et cetera. Any regrets about stopping for a long time? Like, hey, you know, that was a great time. That was a blast. Maybe I should have done it a little longer? Or none no? at all. Absolutely none at all, no. I mean, you know, the, my attitude towards that stuff has always been, and it's maybe it's cavalier, but that, like if I wanted it again, I would just go back and do it again. You know, mm -hmm. every once in a while, I'll jump back in and do an acting role because I love it, and it's right. enjoyable. I, sh I shot a movie in Spain this fall with Elijah Wood and John Cusack because I love the director and I love those actors, and I got to play a bad guy. I love playing bad guys. So I just went and did it. You uh -huh. know, That's so awesome. for me, okay. it's like if I can do stuff and it's fun, but um, I get so much satisfaction out of creating projects and um, it's really like all I ever really want to do. And it's hard enough to get your movies made and to, and to sort of get stuff right that I don't even find I have the time that, that often. Right. So now the movie's about Napster and as I'm watching it, I, I, was, I have to be honest with you, I was conflicted throughout mm -hmm. because on the one hand, the point that a lot of the guys from the Napster perspective is ma are making is absolutely true. The you know these uh, movie industry, I'm sorry, the music industry is used to making money in a certain way, and 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 I had never thought of it this way until I saw the movie mm -hmm. that they had made money from the you know the physical the physical stuff mm -hmm. and then the cassettes and the CDs etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every time you got a new thing, they made the you know they made the money all over again, yeah. right? So they had this great ride for so long. Yeah. And then so they didn't want to adjust when people were getting their music in a new way. So screw you, I don't have much sympathy for you, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they were getting the songs for free, mm -hmm. right? And so a part of me, I don't know if I'm a stickler for it, I don't know. I felt like, well, they shouldn't get the songs for free. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is that legitimate? What's your take on that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because... Uh, you know, and this gets talked about quite a lot in the movies, is a, the, a lot of the, and the movie's not just some, you know, uh, it's not attempting to be some kind of holy pro-Napster, everything they did was right, kind of. It's a, it's a chronicle of an extremely complex time in our history um, that I felt needed some context, especially since things haven't gotten any less contentious today, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years later, um, which is shocking and, and tragic. Um, but... The facts of Napster, not my opinion, but the facts of Napster is that you had these two guys 
Sean Fanning had this vision, and his vision was mostly for a global community. And I remember that was one of the affinities that he and I had when I first met him, because that was my, that's what blew my mind about Napster when it first showed up, was not, yeah. oh cool, I can pull an MP3 down faster, but it was like, I was working off of BBSs and news groups and all these very clunky um, and, and unstable services for connecting to other people online. But clearly, even late 80s for laymen like me, the internet was about to change the world completely and connect everybody. And yet, it wasn't doing that yet. It wasn't capable of it. And suddenly in 99, in the age of dial-up, when everything was crazy slow, overnight, Napster appeared, and I was chatting with people all over the world in real time. The thing moved very fast. Uh, it was a global community that worked. You had this extraordinary media sharing service. And it was the, the revolutionary sort of paradigm shift of it that blew my mind. And I remember meeting Fanning and going, this is the coolest, you know, this is an amazing community. He goes, that's great that you see it as a community because that's my vision. The music and the file sharing is secondary. You know, what my vision was, was creating a global community that worked, that would link people together. And so Napster was really a, a, a company started by two very brilliant but very business naive guys that was solely based on their ability to get licensing deals from the record industry. There was no way that they were gonna make a penny and survive as a company if they couldn't charge money for the service, meaning they weren't a free service. They weren't mm -hmm. built to be a free service. That was the way that Sean launched that thing because that's the way the technology that he coded worked and that's how he implemented it. And that, mm -hmm. you can, you could talk about the ethics of that all day long. You could say that he was wrong to do that. You could say that it was naive or morally re reprehensible. Whatever you want to say, their end game, the only way they would have survived, was to take this, this really extraordinary technology, get a licensing deal from the label, become a pay service like Spotify or iTunes or whatever. And because they weren't able to do that, because the labels wouldn't do business with them, and again, on the label side, whether you agree or not, whether you want to brand them as villains or as just people that were like, you know, why should we do business with two punk 17 year olds, is kind of irrelevant. The fact is they didn't. Napster got shut down, and a year later, Steve Jobs came along and built the iTunes store and took off. So yeah, I, you know, we don't, I don't see the world black and white. So there's, of course, it's all nuance, et cetera. But so one thing I wasn't clear on, I really wanted to ask you is, what did Napster offer the music industry in the negotiations that the music industry said no to? Like, was there a reasonable offer made? Because you're right, of course, they want to make money from it. Otherwise, they can't pay back yeah. Bertelsmann and all this stuff, yeah. et cetera, that they, Music industry said no. Well, there were many, many offers that were made, and there were many attempts by David Boys and others to, to do deals with labels. The, the, the labels, because they didn't trust, like, or even have the ability, because the labels aren't really one man, it's like a whole bunch of companies that are in competition. So, mm -hmm. you know, to be fair to the record industry, um, and there's many sides to their story that are really important to understand if you want to give them a fair shake, you know, they didn't operate as a uniform front. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, they had the RIA, which is a trade organization which represents them, but the labels are in competition with each other. So it wasn't like they'd all get together and go, Fred, Joe, Bob, all right, let's go in and do a deal. They were all like, screw you, what are you doing? What's the guy doing over there? Mm -hmm. And um, so nobody was really willing to go to Napster and make a deal. What Napster was offering was basically the same thing Steve Jobs ended up offering, which was, we've got our arms around all these consumers. You may want to call them pirates or, or thieves, whatever you want to call them. Well, there's 60 million consumers. There's mm -hmm. no other way of looking at them. Mm -hmm. we, and we can take this group of people and we can create subscription services. We can create, I mean, all the things that iTunes did. We can do a dollar a song. A lot of those ideas came from Napster in the beginning. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the labels were not interested in doing business with them for a lot of reasons that were valid as well as reasons that may have been short-sighted. So they I, should have taken that deal in hindsight. In hindsight, they probably should have taken the deal because their business model got shredded anyway. People stopped buying CDs, they started buying individual songs. Yeah. And if you're going to do that, why not take a deal with Napster then? Well, I mean, I think that, that you know, it's really hard for me to look at that reality. There's, there's so no way that that ever would have happened. It's hard for me to even look at that as a potential scenario and go, if only you had done it, because it's, it's so complicated. And the idea that this giant behemoth of like six trucks that are, you know, individual record uh, labels, driving down this freeway at 100 miles an hour that they could ever have like pulled on the brakes and pulled U-turns and done a deal with, I just, I just to me, and there are people who disagree with me, but I think it's impossible that it ever, ever would have happened. I, I think you're absolutely right. So that's where it gets really interesting. So what lesson do we learn from that for today's world? So there's now, you know, in all the different industries, TV, movies, et cetera, music still, 
many trucks going 100 miles an hour down the road. Yeah. What can they not turn around on? What are they going to get hit with they can't, you know, adapt to? What's yeah. your sense of I mean, this is, you know, in giant caveat neon light letters, you know, this is my opinion as like a, as Joe Punter, who just happens to know a lot about it because I've been working on the story for 11 years. So I know a lot of the players involved. I know a lot of the of the issues, but I'm, you know, I'm not the arbiter of, of the Napster story other than having rode shotgun on it. But from my perspective, um, and as someone who's been around the block a while, I've been, you know, I've been in the DGA and the WJ, I've been in these, these unions, you know, for content since the late 70s. Um, and I, I did a lot of music videos, so I did a lot of stuff in the, within the record industry for years before Napster hit. So for me, it's like, the, the biggest mistake that, that got made then and is being made today is this whole notion of, they may not admit that they're trying to do this, whether it's uh, the content companies or the government or whoever, but they really are trying to break the internet. And I think that's a mistake. I think oh. that, I think that the, the response to the internet that in any manner manifests itself as we will stop it is obviously impossible, which they don't seem to realize. So some of the, a lot of legislation that gets created to, to try to legislate or, or dampen this, this, these issues don't even make any sense with how the internet works. And would, like SOPA, I understand why they tried to do it. I understand the, con I understand the concerns about free content, I, piracy, believe me. We all need to eat. Mm -hmm. um, but, they, but they did not have any bearing on the reality of how the internet works, and they wouldn't have worked even if they'd have been passed. They made no sense with how the decentralized systems work out there. Um, so the whole notion that we're going to try to like look at this technology as something that needs to be broken, stopped, that it was, that it was created by a bunch of, of criminals, um, that people who download are pirates, um, rather than what they are, which is consumers using technology because it's really convenient. The average Joe, and th this kind of goes back to your first question about the question of free that you had. To me, in 1999, when I was an after user, it was never about free. To most of us who were, you know, who really took to the net, we didn't, it's, and I think this is really the biggest misunderstanding that the industries and the government have about the, the internet and the people who use it. We didn't, we didn't download they may not want to accept this, but it's the truth. We didn't download because it was free. We downloaded because it was convenient. Oh, yeah. yeah and that's, that's, it's that's a super really, really, yeah. really important distinction because you, you're, people are being criminalized for using evolutionary technology, which was coming anyway, because it is a better system than the pre-existing system. Now, that system may not want to change. It may not know how to change. It may not have the ability to change. There may be many valid reasons why it can't just turn on a dime and adopt all these new systems, and I respect that. I do. However, to then turn around and criminalize this whole populace and say, what you're doing is, is criminal, and all you want is free stuff, is extremely damaging and toxic, and it alienates that all these consumers that you want to be embracing your content are turning into rebels and anarchists, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's, it's prolonged what should have been a much simpler um, solution. I thought in, in 02, 03, when I walked away from the NAFSA story the first time, surely they're going to realize that this is about convenience, and then Steve Jobs came along and prove to these industries that people want, I mean, in 2003, people started buying tracks on iTunes. I mm -hmm. mean, if that wasn't proof that the public wasn't thieves, I don't know what was. Yeah, I use iTunes for convenience on two different, well, I don't have time to go and shop and figure out the albums, whatever. I know that song, I want that song, it's convenient. To, I, 99 cents, have at it, Hoss, who cares, right? right? I'm ready to do it. Plus, I don't want to figure out, like I'm not a tech guy, right? right. It's funny because we set up this huge online news yeah, show, yeah. but I'm not a tech guy. So I don't want to figure out Napster or Kazaa or mm -hmm. up, whatever, right? Yeah. I just want to go, okay, that's easy. I'm a dummy. I'll press that button and get it, yeah. right? So I think your point on convenience is really strong. So, and then, you know, you triggered a thought in me that I think you were trying to. So Napster was, in a sense, a microcosm of the entire internet and the battle that would 
that the internet would engage over time. That's why I wanted to make the movie. That's exactly why I wanted to make the movie. And, and that's why I wanted to make the movie in 2013. I had an opportunity to make it in 04, 05 as a narrative. I wrote it as a narrative originally at a studio and it went to turn around and I walked away. And I was like, you know, the, 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 the culture did not seem to understand the net that well. It didn't understand the issues that well. And I felt like I was barking into the wind. Um, in, in 2013, I really felt like Napster was the perfect metaphor, symbol, for a much broader conversation about what's going on in terms of, of youth revolts, the youth divide between pre-existing systems, older systems, in terms of, of trust, transparency, the free market system, you know, Western culture, how it assimilates information. I mean, look at what just happened in Turkey, you know, over the last few days where the, you know, they were really referring to Twitter as a menace. You yeah. know, they're referring to Twitter in Turkey. I mean, these are the times that we live in. I, I, there's nothing funnier than a tweet being a menace. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I just love saying Twitter. Yeah, and I, and I love the disconnect where the prime minister is saying, like, uh, Twitter is full of, it turns out Twitter is full of lies. Like, yeah, look, yeah. It, it turns out the internet is life. And right. yes, in life there are a lot of lies and there's exactly. a lot of truth yeah. and, and everything in between, yeah. right? And that represents the argument though, doesn't it? Because it's like, it's always, people are always trying to put their arms around the whole net and go, well, you know, all these guys were getting stuff for free so they're all bad. And not, never, looking, never looking at the nuance of it. And, and I think there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of fear, you know, um, a lot of confusion as to what the net even is. Um, but I think that in... No, I, that's easy. It's a series of tubes. That's it. Yeah. We're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I heard it from Senator Stevens. <laughs> that's right. Okay. So. Well, I wanted to ask one more thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, you said that, that they can't stop the internet. And sometimes I worry about that. Because power and money has a great way of controlling things, right? And they've done it in almost all the other forms of media. I mean, if you want to get on TV, there's huge gatekeepers. Even so in radio. Certainly in movies, and money is a gatekeeper in some sense. But you know, there's less gatekeepers, ironically, in movies, which cost more than there are in TV. Because in TV, you have a certain number of channels, right. and it's very limited, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas movies are a little broader. Are you sure they can't control the internet? Uh, because what if they pass those laws? I mean, it's really easy to buy our politicians through legalized bribery, right? Yeah. And so, so why why are you so sure? If you're so sure, well. Here's what I meant. I didn't mean I didn't mean that they can't cause enormous damage to what we now know as the net. I don't mean that they that um, if certain you know really restrictive laws get passed, um, that it won't really sour what makes the, democ the democratization of our culture such an important moment in in our history. Um, I think that there's a lot of damage that can be done. Don't get me wrong. What I meant was actually two things. One is that this, the philosophical desire to break the net, I think, is a mistake, just fundamentally. Right. right. Um, that the whole approach- You're almost fighting time and nature. Exactly, that this right. whole approach of trying to examine it as a, it's not, you know, people use so many buzzwords, buzzwords today, it's not another platform in a multi-platform world. Mm -hmm. I mean, the internet is an extremely expansive, complex, you know, s multitude of systems, right? So you can't take this sort of, the whole philosophical attitude of I'm going to break the net or, or restrict the net or legislate the net is you're, you're fighting with air and it's just, it's, it's a misnomer. Um, it's not to say they can't really hurt it. I think there's already been a lot of damage done. There's already, I'd like to say this when I talk about Napster, Napster was a more free, fluid, expansive, um, and I would say a much more profound uh, global community than anything that exists today. It's gone. Right, so we already don't have what we had in the days of Napster. Napster was an amazing system, regardless of the file sharing even. Um, so there are a lot of restrictions. What I, what I do think though, and I think this is something that people like Steve Wozniak have been talking about recently, is that you know, this thing is a big open highway and uh, it's, it's decentralized and it's hard to pin down and if you try to stick you know, a piece of gum against this hole, well, you've got a whole other thing over here that's going. And you could almost build an undernet around the internet if you had to. And I believe that that's what would actually happen. An undernet? Okay, I don't want to get to that point, <laughs> but it does sound kind of badass. 
Yeah, it <laughs> so, does, yeah, yeah. And you know, we call this place Rebel Headquarters. Well, there you that'd go. That'd be a good place for an undernet. Yeah, yeah. Okay. don't give it away, man. Okay, okay sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're definitely not gonna do that. Yeah, no undernet here, no undernet. <laughs> All right, Alex Winter, the movie is called Downloaded. It's gonna come out in theaters yep. at the end of June. Mm -hmm. And then where can they get it after that? After that, it comes out, I mean, I'm mostly focusing on the digital release for the movie about this subject matter. So iTunes, uh, Cable VOD hits in July. And then um, we'll be doing a, uh, a really great robust uh, streaming um, release with AOL uh, a little bit later, uh, late summer, early fall. All right, Alex Winter, thanks so much. Thank for you so us. much. Appreciate yeah. it.